We are live in Dick's Hill. We're there. In Lower Manhattan. Live from Stanford. We're live from LaGuardia Airport. We're live in Smithtown. In Jersey City. Reporting live from Patterson. In Bedford Stuyvesant. Reporting live in Flatfish. On the ground. In the air. New stop to 7 is on the scene. We're there. We brought you this story first in an exclusive report. Eyewitness News. Boy, the news comes first. Right here on Channel 7. There are Watching Eyewitness News this morning with Rob Hanrahan and Nancy Lou. Good morning, Charlie. It's wake-up time. It's like having your own personal newscast. Bill Evans' AccuWeather forecast. It's rain today, Charlie, so you need a hat. Helps you get dressed. Thanks. Two helicopters and Joe Nolan's Metro traffic give you twice the coverage. Charlie, get going. The bridges are a mess. Don't forget your briefcase. Charlie? Charlie? Charlie. So wake up to Eyewitness News this morning. Charlie, your briefcase. Thanks. They've got the news just for you. Coming this May. Eyewitness News has in-depth coverage that really hits home. Medical records falsified. Patients in jeopardy. Who's the culprit? The trail leads to state officials. See who's out to get you. Are moving companies out to rip you off? See for yourself as we go undercover. Special reports that look out for you. Getting back into shape after a long winter, I'll show you how to do it and not get hurt. The important information you need to hear. When your kids are out of sight, how do you know they're safe? This May, turn to Eyewitness News. Where the news comes first, right here on Channel 7. Diamonds, the gift. Hi, everybody. I'm Roz Abrams. Welcome to Views in Review, a chance for us to share some of the highlights from our Saturday evening magazine program. We begin tonight with Diana Williams and a story on the Flemington Speedway. The racing takes place at the Flemington Fairgrounds. The fair dates back to the 1840s. They raced horses here until cars took over. Paul Kuhl is president of the Speedway. 81 years ago, during the fair, and at that time was a four-day fair, the uh, first auto race was held here. It was one of the first ever held in the United States. Uh, they dubbed it as 50 laps in 50 minutes, which was great speed then. The uh, whole purse was $1,000, which is nothing today. Drivers are required to wear state-of-the-art safety gear. This is like a three-piece Nomex suit. It's uh, fireproof, but it's uh, pretty heavy. It's three layers of fireproof material, and basically it, uh, it protects you from burn. You're good about three minutes of a, of, of a good fire before, um, you know, you feel any burns, but I don't plan on staying in it that long if it does go on fire. All that fireproof material can make a driver mighty hot. Most of the time, it's well over 120 degrees inside the car. I mean, you, you can see you just sweat and sweat. Jim Long comes from Staten Island every weekend. He's been racing for 12 years. I come up from a family of racing. My dad, basically, uh, my whole life I've been around racing from sprint cars to midgets, go-karts, to all the stuff, and I just kind of was born into it. Jim owns a trucking company. His pit crew is made up of some of his employees. He says auto racing is an expensive venture. Like a car like this basically would run you, between the engines, are around $10,000. There is a set of rules, so they're pretty limited to what you can do, but around ten grand gets you the best you can buy. And a car is about fifteen grand. Uh, you're looking like a truck like this and trailer, you're looking total probably between fifty and sixty grand for the total truck and trailer. Um, the components, as far as the racing part, the tools, just the paraphernalia that goes with it, you're talking another sixty grand. So you're looking at about two hundred thousand. Jim got a new car this season, encouraged by the success he had last year. We've been in the top uh, two here for the last uh, couple weeks, and uh, basically the last three years we've finished in the top five. So uh, we have we won two races last year, but this year we've just kind of just been missing. A little bit of traffic coming through or just uh, track circumstances. But uh, basically we're getting to the front now. So we're third in points, and uh, we're in striking distance of the championship this year. Zane drives a NASCAR-modified racing car. It reaches speeds of up to 140 miles an hour. No small feat when you consider this racetrack. Although it is actually square, it is driven more like a circle. There are no straightaways. It is a challenge even to the best drivers. We've done quite a few things to it, but the main thing is widen it. 
The only place it narrows down and where a lot of excitement is, is because we couldn't move the grandstand back when we widened it, so everything else was widened except the main stretch in front of the grandstand. And of course, that leads to crashes, which are always a thrill to the fans. Of course, for the drivers, the accidents are no thrill. Speed and competition are what fuel 19-year-old Zane Zayner. He's going for the big time, and every lap is a step closer to it. His father, Tom, gave up his driving days to help Zane fulfill his dream. This course is very tough, very fast. Uh, it's real good for experience, though. So that's why we're here, to give Zane more experience. Now, when we go to other tracks, they'll seem much easier to drive and, and what have you. So this is a, a very good place to learn. Unfortunately, on this night, Zane's championship dreams are delayed. Early during the first 20-lap race, his car was involved in a massive pileup. Probably won't run for a couple weeks now. It's hurt real bad. I've probably got to, you know, change the chassis and the body and start over again. We got two features tonight, and you see what happens. I mean, you got to survive the first one. So I was all right until the last car came by, and he just hit me flat out. I was braced myself, but on the rebound there, my arm just hit the bar inside there. Hey, it's part of the game. It's unfortunate it happened. You know, we were doing pretty good. It's just one of them deals of racing. Next up on Views and Review, a big birthday celebration for a New York City institution. The New York Times is 100 years old. In an unprecedented tribute, four cultural centers of New York are all paying homage to the venerable paper. At the New York Public Library, the exhibition Headlines, Deadlines, Bylines explores the more public face of the New York Times over the last century through clippings from the morgue. At the Museum of Modern Art, photojournalism of the Times is highlighted for the last century. And at the American Museum of Natural History, science reporting in the Times over the last 100 years is the focus. And the Pierpont Morgan Library tells the behind-the-scenes story of the man behind the paper. Christine Nelson is associate curator. Adolf Fox's story is really an American success story. He lived the American dream. Ox was the son of immigrants, Bavarian Jewish immigrants, to America, and he grew up in the South. A high school dropout, he worked his first newspaper job at 13, and by age 20, had acquired part of the Chattanooga Times. At 38, he brazenly came to Manhattan to rescue a failing New York Times. He wrote to his wife every single day, giving her reports of his work in New York and his negotiations for the paper. June 16, 1896. My darling wife and baby, I have had another eventful day. Ox had to convince shareholder and banker J. Pierpont Morgan that he was the man to revitalize the paper. I called upon Mr. J. Pierpont Morgan. It took me just 15 minutes to secure Mr. Morgan's signature for $25,000. I walked out on air with his signature in my inside pocket. Within a month, he introduced a magazine section and a book review. Ox not only oversaw the daily operations, he created a credo of journalistic principles that set the Times apart from the tabloid press of William Randolph Hearst. The New York Times will give the news impartially, without fear or favor, regardless of any party, sect, or interest involved. Ox thought that Hearst resorted to um, unfit tactics in order to sell papers. And that's why Ox coined his slogan for the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print, to distinguish the New York Times from the so-called yellow press of the day. Ox understood the power of pictures, and a photo archive of some five million shots is the result. Peter Galassi is chief curator of the Museum of Modern Art. One of the things that the exhibition demonstrates is the richness and variety of news photography. It's not just the famous pictures of the major events. It's, uh, it's celebrities and sports and all the minor events that go into making up the daily paper. Some shots are a tribute to the precision of the photographer's timing. Others are a testament to their bravado. That's a brilliant example of what the newspaper people call a spot news photograph. Uh, it's uh, late July 1945, uh, B-25 bomber took off from Long Island, gets lost in the fog, 
crashed into the Empire State Building at about the 79th floor. Ernie Sisto, who was one of the first and one of the best of the Times staff photographers, arrives at the scene uh, shortly thereafter. And he realizes that the only way he's going to get a clear picture of this hole is by leaning out very far out the window uh, uh, of the 81st floor. So he made a deal with the other photographers that if they'd hold him by the belt as he dangled out the building, that he'd make a shot uh, for each of them. Technology and photo equipment has evolved over the last hundred years, but one staple of news photography has remained, the posing politician. The, the photographs of politicians are very instructive because although all news photographs uh, have to speak in the language of directness and immediacy, in fact, a lot of the pictures that we see in the newspaper are better described as collaborations between the photographer and the subject. Then Congressman Richard Nixon is a case in point. You see him there posing like Sherlock Holmes with his uh, magnifying glass peering at the, at the microfilm. The important thing about the picture, though, is that, in fact, of course, he never would have looked at the microfilm that way, and the enlargements are sitting on the desk right in front of him. If you love to garden, but you don't know the names of a lot of garden plants, this next story is for you. It's a marriage of Mother Nature and high technology. Campanula carpatica. Cosmos by Panatus. Instead of just paging through a book, you can actually use a database of many plants or actually do design work in terms of landscaping um, using your home computer that previously the resources just weren't available. Laura Grams is with Books That Work, a California software company that has just launched the Garden Encyclopedia. It's a way for people to actually uh, find the right plants or do some planning before they start their projects and therefore avoid costly mistakes. Your question may be, what part of the country do I live in and what plants are going to thrive in what zone and this covers um, all of the United States and so you can go in and actually indicate which zone you're in. When you go into um, this area to search for specific plants that you had in mind, say you wanted perennials and you were wanting them to be of red and blue tones that bloom in the summer, you would want to go in here and indicate that you were going to be in zone four or zone five. So that would give you some sense of, through this database, that 103 plants have been found. And this gives you a photo album of the different plants that have come up given that criterion. Take a look at this bellflower. And this gives you information about the plant itself. You can also take a closer look at what the plant looks like by increasing the image. Here you can go into the notes section if you wanted to customize this and say, one of my favorites. Besides the vast research possibilities, there are plenty of tips and techniques to learn. Then dip the stems in rooting hormone to encourage growth. Strip off the, the benefit of these videos is that it allows you to get some specific instruction and to see an expert doing something that you might want to practice a couple of times, you might want to watch the video, um, you might want to hear the instructions more than once. If you are a novice and you're learning about plants, it's a helpful resource. Or if you are an expert gardener and want to categorize the plants that you favor, you can keep notes in the software program and really customize that to you. Sarah gave us her own useful tips about perennial gardens, including the right way to water. In general, you should give your garden an inch of water a week. And when you do that, give it all at once because we want to encourage deep rooting. So if the water really soaks down, the plants will root deeply. The reason for that is if we have a drought situation where you can't water, the more deeply rooted the plants are, the more likely they are to survive the drought. Anyone with perennials knows this is the season to enjoy the show, but it's not a free ticket. This time of year, it's a maintenance time of year. So that means that you are watering a lot, deadheading, which is taking off spent flowers, staking, basic sorts of primping. There's no such thing as a low-maintenance perennial garden. Absolutely not. When you're planting perennials, it's best to plant in groups of three or five or seven, rather than just one plant, 
because you want it to look naturalistic as if it sort of just happened. There's lots of different textures and colors. You've got this yellow with the evergreen, very um, ferny foliage, and even more fernier and finer behind it with the fennel. There are bargains this time of year, but newcomers to your garden will need special attention. You actually can, can more or less plant almost any time, but the reason they tell you to plant just in the spring and the fall is because you don't have to water as much. If I plant something now, I'm really going to have to baby it to get it through the summer heat. And finally tonight, a little art for the body, for those who don't want the permanence of a tattoo. Basically, it's an art form of women. It's been practiced for thousands of years. Nobody can really quite date it. Um, the earliest traces of henna are on Egyptian mummies, on the fingernails of Egyptian mummies. But um, there are actually cave paintings in North Africa and in India where women are seen having henna painting done to their hands and feet. We turn the gallery into a mendi parlor, which is the ancient art of henna tattooing for centuries. Women in the Islamic, the Hindu, the Jewish culture. Uh, before they got married, they would paint their hands and decorate their bodies, and the parties would last for days and days. To create the feel of a traditional henna tattooing party, Margaret Bodell invited a couple of Mendy artists, Ronnie Patel, who learned this art as a child in India, and Loretta Room, who's Ronnie's apprentice. In every culture, it, from, let's say, Pakistan to um, Morocco, it's, first of all, it's, it's laden with a lot of superstition and, and a tremendous amount of mythology, and there's a lot of controversy as to the origins, but in every culture, the, the mythology includes the origins of henna. So, for instance, Muslims believe that uh, the prophet Muhammad, it was, the henna plant was his favorite flower, and it's associated with his daughter Fatima, or Fatima. And then in Hindu culture, it's specifically a symbol of marriage love in Hindu culture. In traditional Hindu ceremony, the, the two people have never met before. Even Rani is from an arranged marriage. And so the, the hands and the feet would be very elaborately decorated, and it would be the, the groom's first glimpse of the wo woman he was to marry. There's a deeper significance, which when I interviewed a woman from Algeria, she said, well, it's really associated with fertility because of the red color. And it had to do with um, the bride becoming pregnant the night of the, the wedding night. Each region and culture has its own traditional patterns, but here, everyone's allowed to choose or create their own. In traditional Mendy, it's very, very dense, and it covers, for weddings, it covers the entire hand and foot in a very dense pattern that looks almost like a lace glove. And I think what was so fascinating to me was the idea of adapting it to this culture and to different cultures and using um, all sorts of ancient designs from from Japan, from Africa, from all over, and to integrate those. Mindy is the Indian word for the henna plant. The leaves are crushed to create a mud. Then it's squeezed onto the skin. Recipes can include ingredients like tea, coffee, okra water, eucalyptus, and various oils. The mixture is actually good for the skin. It's like a clay or a, a mud. It's like a face mask. And it hardens on the skin. And then um, you just scrape it off in a couple of hours. You leave it on overnight. So, um, and then it will come out uh, reddish or orangish in the morning, but it will go deep red if you leave it on long enough. And then, this is about a week old, and this is a couple of days old, so that gives you some idea. And unlike permanent tattoos, it fades completely in a few weeks. This is good for you. It's not permanent. You can try a tattoo, and also it brings people together in a nice way. This isn't fast. You have to be here a little while, and people can relax and talk, and it's just a nice, warm feeling, a neighborhood, community feeling that goes on here. That's what I like about it the best. That does it for Views and Review. Be sure to join us at our regularly scheduled time, Saturday evenings at 7.30, right here on ABC7. I'm Roz Abrams. Wake up right with your own personal hotel-style wake-up call. Call 540-WAKE. That's 540-W-A-K-E. Get out of bed and get ahead. Call 540-WAKE. That's 540-W-A-K-E. Places to go, people to see, don't be late. Call 540-WAKE for a convenient hotel-style wake-up call. Just $2 from Touchstone Phones.
Call right now and move up in the world. Meet Together, the world's largest personal introduction service. Yeah, some things are hard to put into words. Why a certain person clicks with you and why another person does not. And it was just a great, a great level of understanding. And that was how it was. It was really great. We just had a wonderful time and we've been together ever since. There's a Together office near you. Call today. Channel 7 Eyewitness News, where the news comes first. From dogs to cats to bears to buffalo, this is a show that features the entire world of animals. Hi, I'm Marriott Hartley, and this is Wild About Animals. 